everyone. My name is Charles Royer. I'm director of the Institute of Politics, and I welcome you to the ARCO Forum for another in our series of interviews, uh, interviews, job interviews with the candidates for president of the United States. Uh, for many years in this country, to free associate the word mayor meant only one response, and that was uh, Richard Daley, who made mayoring an art form in Chicago. And for many years, Democratic Party leaders tried to get Mayor Daley to run for something else. They wanted him to run for the Senate, to run for governor, even to be considered as Vice President of the United States. To all of these invitations, the mayor had only one response. After being mayor of Chicago, he would say, all that other stuff would be a step down. Our guest tonight obviously does not feel that way, at least when it comes to going from the mayor's office to the Oval Office. Larry Agron, who was born in Chicago but grew up to be the mayor of Irvine, California, is a Democrat and a candidate for President of the United States. He's the fourth announced candidate to appear here in the forum in recent weeks. For eight years, Larry Agron was executive director of the Center for Innovative Diplomacy, a foreign policy think tank. As mayor, he tried to practice what he preached about thinking globally and acting locally, even going so far as to travel to Vietnam to win the release of the father of a Vietnamese refugee living in Irvine, whom the State Department could not manage to, to free. His innovative city was the only American city to win the United Nations Award for Environmental Achievement in 1990. Mr. Egren is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of California and a 1969 graduate of Harvard Law. Please join me in welcoming to the forum Larry Egren. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Royer, for that kind introduction. I don't know how many of you know that uh, Charles Royer was one of the distinguished and pioneering mayors during the 1980s, during a time when it was difficult to be mayor of an American city, as it still is. So I think uh, you have among you tonight uh, two former mayors whose pleasure it was to serve at a time of changing national priorities, priorities that were changing for the worst. Uh, more about that uh, in just a moment. I had a chance to meet a few of you before tonight's gathering, but um, uh, to many of you, I may still be not Larry Agron, but Larry Who. And I thought I'd take a few moments to tell you just a few things about myself. In uh, announcing and having the opportunity to seek the presidency with other candidates of a true merit, I've learned a great deal about these other candidates, and some of them have very compelling personal stories. Uh, stories of great trial and hardship as young children, parents who died, uh, an upbringing that was very difficult, people who emerged from impoverished conditions to, uh, in a sense, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and become very effective students, workers, politicians, and candidates for the presidency of the United States. My background is very different. I think I'm a, a very typical beneficiary, along with tens of millions, hundreds of millions, who were raised in a fundamentally middle-class environment in the post-World War II period, uh, during a time when our country was investing a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of talent in seeing to it that our generation had all the opportunities possible. We were great beneficiaries of the best that liberal democratic policymakers had to offer. We benefited from great public school systems. I went to public schools in California at a time when public schools were considered wonderful institutions for learning. We used to, as a matter of fact, in California, proudly boast that our schools were even better than the schools in New York City because theirs were fundamentally terrific schools. I uh, also had my free milk every day provided by the government, a subsidized lunch of one kind or another, and I can't remember all the changing arrangements over the years. My father went to work um, on publicly funded roadways and freeways. Like millions of other children, I was um, inoculated against polio in 1955, a great public health program funded principally by the federal government. 
I benefited from all those public health and private health programs that directly and indirectly had public support. My grandparents were beneficiaries of Social Security and then Medicare, which eased their concerns about whether or not they would be bankrupted uh, in their final years of life. I went to the University of California at Berkeley, got a wonderful, <laughs> there we are, got a wonderful uh, public education, learned a lot about the Constitution and the right to protest against Lyndon Johnson's disgusting war in Vietnam and protest for civil rights. I learned a lot about what it meant to have an inquiring mind. All this at great taxpayer expense. Taxpayers, even in those years, uh, had to uh, pony up five or $10,000 a year to see to it that I got a good public education. I taught law at uh, UCLA and graduate study at UCI on and off uh, after graduating from Harvard Law School, which was probably the last time uh, I did something that was truly private in nature. Uh, what we paid to Harvard was private money, and what they delivered was a quality private education. I say all of this because uh, my wife and I, she uh, is a pediatrician in the uh, Orange County area. She benefited from a, a public education as well, a public university education and graduate study in medicine at UC Irvine. We both were great beneficiaries of public investment in individuals. And I'll tell you, coming from Orange County, California, where I'm hearing time and again from people that what we need is to get government off people's backs. If you ask those people what kind of upbringing they had, where they went to school, what kinds of roads they traveled on, uh, where their children are going to school, what kinds of public health programs they benefited from, you add it all up, you begin to see that they are where they are in life, ahead of the game, because people have had the wisdom to invest in them over many, many years. And that's what we really need to do again. Think about public investment in private individuals as a way of bringing our country along into the uh, later 1990s and into the 21st century. I want to talk a little bit about my public record in Irvine as well. It's an unusual, of course, for a mayor to be considering, let alone campaigning for, the presidency. In Irvine, we managed to do a lot of things, a lot of successful things. Irvine's a master plan city of 110,000 people in the heart of conservative, Republican, Orange County. And just managing to survive politically, I think, was probably my most, uh, my most stirring achievement over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so. We did things by way of environmental protection, open space preservation, universal availability of child care, innovative transportation systems that we acquired funding for and began to design. We provided for affordable housing. We began to think about urban design in ways that really served the interests of people. We tried and largely succeeded in building an integrated community. What was previously almost an all-white community became a, an integrated community, 25% non-white, and that trend continues in the heart of conservative Republican Orange County, California. You can uh, leave Irvine and travel just a little bit up the freeway and actually visit with Watergate co-conspirators or visit the uh, library of Richard Nixon, uh, enter in and march down some of the crooked corridors to the greatest, uh, the greatest collection of political fiction in the Western world. And you begin to realize that actually, even in a conservative right-wing political environment, we can do a lot of things that make a big difference. And I think that's true for the country as a whole as well. Now in announcing my candidacy, we wanted to do a little research into whether or not former mayors had any right, let alone whether there was any precedent, to uh, run for President of the United States. And uh, our, our research, although it's still going on, has revealed some interesting things. Uh, first of all, uh, Millard Fillmore, apparently, we don't confirm this yet, but apparently was the former mayor of Buffalo, New York. So there's one precedent. Uh, Grover Cleveland was also the former mayor, and this is uh, confirmed, the former mayor of Buffalo, New York. Now, Buffalo, New York has really been turning out presidential candidates, and I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, Grover Cleveland, interestingly enough, was last elected 
President of the United States in 1892. So this would be, I think, a wonderful 100th year anniversary. And what a better way to celebrate it than uh, by electing yet another former mayor, President of the United States. We have some more uh, recent precedent. I think that's uh, stirring, however. Uh, Willie Brandt, uh, some of you, I think, are old enough to remember that he was the mayor of Berlin during a time of great international tension and went on from there to become the chancellor of West Germany. And more recently still, Boris Yeltsin was the appointed, not the elected, he was the appointed mayor of Moscow and, of course, is now president of the Russian Republic. So we do have, I think, a number of useful precedents, uh, contemporary as well as older. Maynard Jackson uh, recently said, and he's the mayor of Atlanta, Maynard Jackson recently said on Meet the Press that he believed the next president of the United States ought to be someone who has been mayor of an American city. And I thought, of course, he was talking about me. I think he was thinking about himself or Ray Flynn. He could have been thinking about Charles Royer. He could have been thinking as well about Ann Rudin, mayor of uh, Sacramento, or James Scheibel, mayor of St. Paul. He could have been thinking about a host of U.S. mayors, present mayors, former mayors, who I believe have something special to offer in the national discourse about what our policies and priorities ought to be in the year 1993, when the next president is sworn in, and beyond. I think Maynard Jackson understood, as I understood and want to convey to you tonight, that during the 1980s, we struggled as mayors against national priorities that were perverse and deeply damaging to the interests of this country. As we were struggling to provide for affordable housing, a cleaner environment, as we were struggling to provide for child care, supportive social services, as we were struggling to do all these things locally, at the national level, Washington insiders, politicians and otherwise, were actually working against our interests. They were working against our interests as they massively escalated an arms budget to a point where it was doubled during the course of the early and mid-1980s, reaching the equivalent today of $300 billion per year, where it has remained year after year after year. This was done, incidentally, at the instigation of President Reagan, Vice President Bush, the Reagan-Bush administrations, but it could not have been achieved without the complicity of a go-along Democratic Party. Is that for the Democrats or against their complicity? <laughs> Absolutely. The Democratic Party has failed during the course of the 1980s to deliver on a true opposition program that framed new priorities for our country. And they failed not only through the early and mid-1980s, but I'll tell you, if you had any doubt at all in 1986 or 1987 that the Cold War was over, if you had any doubt about it in 1988, when the last presidential election took place, you couldn't possibly have any doubt after November of 1989, November 9th specifically, 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, when ordinary citizens, pro-democracy forces, people like you and like me, with hammers and chisels and their bare hands, tore down the Berlin Wall. At that point, over half the people in the world, some three billion people or more, bore witness to a transformational historic event. The Berlin Wall came down, democracy surged across Central Europe, into Eastern Europe, and even into the Soviet Union itself. The joy that we witnessed, we felt ourselves. And yet, if you were to examine the federal budget in 1989, in 1990, in 1991, for fiscal year 1992, you would have believed that nothing happened at all. You would have to conclude that we had had a Rip Van Winkle president and a Rip Van Winkle Congress that just slept through it all. What I want to talk to you about tonight is a new American security built on the reality of the end of the Cold War, built on this historic opportunity 
to reorganize national priorities in a way that serves the interests of the American people and serves them well. I want to talk to you about what's now an archaic term, apparently, because they've stopped talking about it in Washington, a peace dividend. And not a peace dividend of a billion dollars or two billion dollars, but $150 billion a year, fully one half of our military budget, which can safely be cut here and be cut now, now that the Cold War is over. I need your applause because uh, let me tell you, we have a real struggle ahead of us in all of this. I want to spell out in some detail what all this would mean. I've had a chance to not only meet with, debate with, share a platform with other candidates in the course of this early um, primary and caucus season that will, of course, uh, quicken as the, as the months wear on. And I, I want to tell you some differences between myself and other candidates because I think they're important to point out. Uh, one reason I'm in this race is because I don't think there are voices for cities and towns and for the people who live there. I don't think there are voices in this race prepared to boldly capitalize on the end of the Cold War, prepared to say, yes, hallelujah, it is over. Let's bring the resources home. So unlike other candidates, I want to spell out specifically how this can be done. First, unlike other candidates, as your president, I would order the immediate withdrawal of all U.S. forces from Western Europe and from Japan, bringing them home no later than by 1994 so that they could put in further service here or be demobilized to the maximum extent possible. It is just absurd on the face of it that when everyone recognizes that we have no further enemy confronting us in Europe or confronting our Japanese allies, that we continue to spend $200 billion per year, fully two-thirds of our entire military budget, an average of over $2,000 per American household per year on the defense of Western Europe and Japan. This at a time when the Western European and Japanese economies are surging forward, when their citizens enjoy a quality of life better than our own, largely because they've been under a defense shield provided by the United States, and they've been permitted to rebuild their own societies in a way that we have not done. Now, does that make sense to you? And does it make sense to you that we have a go-along Congress that year after year endorses the continuing presence of some 350,000 troops, they talk about cutting them, 50,000 here, 50,000 there, phased over a period of years, but authorized 350,000 troops in Western Europe and Japan, 50,000 in Japan, 300,000 in Europe. And all the weaponry, all the supplies associated with their deployment, B-2 bombers, that's what we're talking about, to provide some semblance of support for these troops. MX missiles, all the strategic weapon systems, all of those systems can be canceled or otherwise defunded over a period of years. That's the second element of the program. Let's look at these weapons systems. The B-2 bomber, this is the second generation, of course. I oppose the B-1 bomber, which now is not even a flying turkey. It doesn't fly at all. $25 billion in the early 1980s for a B-1 bomber. That would have been enough to set up a housing trust fund to take care of our affordable housing needs in this country for many, many years. $25 billion down the tube, followed by a B-2 bomber. They're still quibbling over whether or not to go ahead with it at a billion dollars an airplane at a time when people are homeless and hungry without adequate health care in this country. $70 billion proposed for the ultimate build-out of the B-2. The MX missile a largely useless system. It has no enemy against which to be fired at this point. Moreover, if it did have an enemy, it's extremely vulnerable because they never figured out a deployment system for it that would work. At one time, they were going to put it on rail cars in the desert of the Southwest. Uh, they had all these schemes, one after the other. They still have a rail garrison system that's on the drawing boards. Uh, we can't get decent transportation for commuters, and we're talking about transportation for guided missiles. 
all of these systems have to be cut, canceled, including Star Wars, which bears no relationship to any threat of any consequence that we can see today or for the foreseeable future. Five to ten billion dollars a year we spend for Star Wars. Others have said, well, at least we ought to continue the research. My response to that is, when there's enough money for research on cures and therapies for cancer, for AIDS, for cystic fibrosis, for a whole host of diseases that are underfunded by way of research for their conquest and cure, when we have funded them properly, then we can talk about funding, theoretically or otherwise, to send weapons into the heavens, but not before. I would also say that a third step in cutting $150 billion a year from the military budget is to conclude a bilateral and then a multilateral weapons freeze, nuclear weapons freeze, suspend all further nuclear weapons testing, and redirect those resources to domestic purposes as well. In 1963, President Kennedy and his administration, in concert with the Soviets, promised that there would be the quick conclusion of a comprehensive test ban treaty. We wouldn't have simply a ban on atmospheric testing, but all nuclear weapons testing would be ended and ended quickly. This promise was reaffirmed in 1968. And I say it's time, a full generation later, to make good on that promise to the people of the world and to end all nuclear weapons testing forever. Furthermore, there's the question of foreign aid, foreign military aid. More than two-thirds of our foreign aid budget is military assistance, and most of it, of the $10 billion or so in foreign military aid, goes to dictators, historically to the Iraqis, to the Panamanians, to one junta after another in El Salvador. The money we send, the weapons they buy, ultimately those weapons are used to oppress their own people, to menace their neighbors, or even to kill American citizens. And it just makes no sense whatsoever, I think, that any fundamental element of our foreign aid program ought to be foreign military aid. We ought to be sending agricultural assistance, educational assistance, humanitarian assistance, food, medicine. These are the building blocks of democracy. These are the elements that ought to bear the label made in the USA, not the weapons that we have been sending. When you add all of this up, it comes to fully $150 billion per year easily. $150 billion per year that can and should be redirected here at home. And unlike other presidential candidates, I want to talk to you as well about the specifics of what we might do to rebuild our society here at home. It's one thing to talk about health and education. It's one thing to talk about improving transportation and infrastructure. But it's quite a different thing to talk about where you're going to get the money from and how you're going to redirect those resources. And I want to take a few minutes of your time to talk about that tonight, because I think it's important that we as Democrats, those of you who are Democrats, uh, those of you who might be independents or even Republicans, attracted to alternative policies, I think you'll only be attracted to such policies if you understand there's a specific plan, a real blueprint for rebuilding our country. So what would I do with the $150 billion a year? First of all, I'd see to it that $25 billion were redirected to the cities and towns of America. Direct assistance, uh, very much like the old general revenue sharing program of the 1970s and early 1980s that served this country so well. $25 billion would mean $100 per resident per year sent to every American city or town. No big federal bureaucracy. The administrative costs would be minimal, 1 or 2 percent. This was a scandal-free program during the 1970s and early 1980s. And what did the mayors and council members in those cities and towns do? They took the money and opened public health clinics, opened libraries, repaired and rehabilitated neighborhoods, invested in public transportation, hired more police officers, more maintenance officers of one kind or another. They built cities in the way that Americans know how to build cities. We know how to do these things. We know how to get the homeless off the streets. We know how to get our kids educated. We know how to open and sustain child care centers and public health centers. We, the American people, did all these things masterfully 
at an earlier period in our American history. Why not do it again? In the case of Boston, uh, this would mean roughly uh, 55 to 60 million dollars a year. In the case of Cambridge, it would be over 10 million dollars a year. Real money to put people to work on real projects of public worth. <clears throat> Closely related to this would be another 15 billion dollars that I'd earmark for direct assistance to public education. Not voodoo education reform by the so-called education president, the kind where somehow we're going to cut funding to education, fire teachers, let classroom sizes grow to 35, 40, 45 students, and then expect students to learn more, to learn better, and to admonish them for not studying enough, not paying attention, and not being serious about their studies. We have to be serious about investing in public education. And I'm willing to say that that investment ought to be direct aid to public school districts, trusting people to govern themselves locally, to do the right thing, to exercise their own prerogatives, to establish their own local priorities. And what would those priorities be? Hiring or rehiring teachers, refurbishing buildings, expanding programs, opening or reopening school libraries. Yes, some school libraries are actually closing. Hiring school nurses and counselors. Seeing to it that we do those things that traditionally have worked to give our kids and teachers alike the fighting chance that they deserve to learn and to teach. We also should note in that regard that this was something that the U.S. Conference of Mayors proposed in 1988. There was a study that I organized uh, through the U.S. Conference of Mayors that pointed out what the meaning of public education would be, how it could be improved, were we to redirect resources there. And what we found was that fully 10 percent or more uh, new teachers could be hired teachers' aides, support staff, across the country this would be 400,000 of them, allowing them to cut classroom sizes, which is the key ingredient to any kind of meaningful education reform. Cutting classroom sizes by 10 percent, 15 percent, in some cases 20 percent and more. Another $40 billion, those of you who have calculators, keep track here. We've got 25 billion, we've got 15 billion. Uh, unlike other candidates running for president, I've said that we have to invest more in national health care. Ultimately, ultimately, we might produce a reformed national health care system, getting rid of all these private insurance companies, the complications, the administrative overlap, and all the rest. We can ultimately get rid of a lot of that and benefit from efficiencies. But in the early going, we're going to have to put more money into health in this country to see to it that the 40 million people, roughly 40 million people, who are uninsured entirely have adequate basic health insurance, and that those who have inadequate insurance are given the benefits so that one serious illness will not wipe them out. More than half of the American people are vulnerable to economic ruin as a result of one serious illness. This will require spending $40 billion or more per year as a down payment on a national health insurance and then a reformed and comprehensive national health care system. Unlike other candidates, I've suggested that we set aside fully $20 billion per year for stepped up environmental protection. I've had it up to here with proposals that we really clean up our environment by initiating more vigorous anti-litter campaigns. How many pieces of paper can you pick up before you get down to the real basics of cleaning up our toxic and nuclear waste sites, of developing a plan to close down dangerous, unsafe nuclear power plants, including the one at Seabrook? When do you get about the business of reforesting the earth, of providing family planning services for everyone who wishes them in this country and around the world? When do you get about the business of cleaning up our streams, our lakes, our oceans, these things require real resources, and fully $20 billion per year, I believe, is necessary as a down payment on a sustainable global environment that allows us to tackle not just our national, but our international global emergency as well. On top of that, 
another $50 billion would remain. And what should we use those $50 billion for? I propose that $50 billion be set aside for two purposes, the final purposes of the program. Honest deficit reduction, how much deeper in debt can we go? How much more steeply can we mortgage the future of our children and their children? If we don't begin to eat into this deficit in a serious way with at least a serious down payment, we will have, I think, failed future generations. But a second purpose as well is to provide job opportunities, what I call a defense workers bill of rights that would provide job guarantees to each and every demobilized soldier as well as civilian defense worker who might otherwise lose his or her job as a result of the new American security, the bringing home of all these resources from Europe, the dismantling of weapon systems and the like. It would be a crime of immense proportions if the scientific genius of this country, if the decent people who have toiled in civilian defense plants or who have risked their lives in some cases for the defense of this country were to be cast aside as we develop new national priorities. Everything I have spoken about is job rich. Rebuilding our cities, rebuilding our education system, reforming our health care system, reclaiming our environment. All of these are job, risk, job rich uh, tasks for the country as a whole. And we ought to be guaranteeing full employment, advanced educational opportunities, income support, for those who otherwise might be adversely affected. They should be beneficiaries, not victims, of the end of the Cold War. Let me give you one example of how this might work, because people have said, oh my god, how much would that cost? Well, it might cost a fair amount. It might cost some billions of dollars. But for those of you who can handle yet a little further mathematics, let me, uh, let me suggest one example. If we were to give each and every soldier stationed in Western Europe or Japan, 350,000 of them, $40,000 for an approved program of advanced education, maybe a down payment on a home, investment in a business, or just income support spread over two or three years. If we were to give each and every one of those soldiers $40,000, the total cost would be $14 billion, which is roughly what we spend in just one month on the defense of Western Europe and Japan. So you begin to see the conversion possibilities that are at hand here. And you begin to see the energy-rich resources that might be developed, bringing people home to go to work on energy-efficient systems, uh, not relying on them to uh, stretch us militarily to defend uh, pipelines in the Middle East and elsewhere, but to actually bring these people home and put them to work on the tasks here at home. Now, there's some question as to whether or not we're going to, through this campaign or otherwise, get from here to there. I'll tell you, if you listen to what comes out of Washington, D.C., you don't hear anything at all that is bold, that is visionary, about what might be done now that the Cold War is over. The best proposal we had was Senator Tom Harkin, who proposed in the United States Senate that $3 billion, $3 billion be cut from the military budget and redirected to Head Start and other programs of social and educational support in this country. It was defeated in the Senate by the Republicans and by half of the Democrats as well. They didn't want to mess around with the budget deal, they said. The budget deal that calls for continuing $300 billion per year military budgets. Now what kind of a deal is that? Two years after the Berlin Wall has come down, after the whole world has changed, when we're presented with dramatic new opportunities. I say it's time to bust the budget deal, and it's time to talk about and do, politically and otherwise, what has to be done to cut the military budget in half. That ought to be the democratic program in 1992. If we don't have a program of that character, we have nothing to offer the American people. Because the grim reality is there are only two ways, only two ways of healing this country and restoring it Again, raising taxes by 150, 200, 250 billion dollars per year, something that no politician is going to propose in this or any uh, near-term election year, 
or cutting the military budget, taking advantage of an historic opportunity and bringing those resources home. Those who are arguing for slow, gradual reductions in the military budget are missing the point. Martin Luther King Jr. regarding uh, the tasks of integration of our society said that gradualism was an addiction and that we ought not to be addicted to it. That it was a drug. And he urged the American people to reject what he called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. We have to reject the tranquilizing drug of slow reductions in the military budget. We have to do that because there is no other way to reorganize our national resources and begin to heal this country. Finally, before taking questions from you, I want to uh, point out that one of the wonderful opportunities as a candidate is to be able to talk with many American people and to be able to, in your own mind, conceptualize what this country is about and what its future ought to be about. And people will tell you nowadays that things are so complicated, so difficult, uh, that uh, we really don't have it within ourselves to govern in such a complex society, to govern ourselves. We have to leave it to experts in Washington, D.C. Certainly when it comes to foreign and military policy, we, the American people, don't know anything. It's Ali North and his kind who know everything. And this is nonsense. And I'll tell you, this was uh, really brought home to me when flying across the country as I have time and again, you look down from 35,000 feet and you see the country and you see what it's made of. And what do you see? You see the vast open space, the rich natural resources of this country, forests and streams, large rivers, lakes, desert, canyons. You see it all in its magnificence. And then you see acre after acre, thousands, millions of acres of farmland. Small farms for the most part, large farms as well. And you understand that the country's made up of farms, of course it is. And then you see as well cities and towns. Not vast cities, but mostly smaller cities. Smaller cities, smaller towns. And while you can't see them, you know of course that the American people live there. And the real tasks before this country are to protect the open space, the beautiful wilderness, the natural land, to see to it that our farms are healthy and that as they feed us, they feed the world as well. And to see to it that our cities and our towns, the schools within them, are healthy institutions. And that the people who live there, most of all, are living in relative harmony, working out their problems, enjoying a quality of life that is improving rather than in decline. These are the great tasks before us, and they really are the tasks of self-government. We have to figure out how to do these things. Our problems are not so complex that we can't figure these things out ourselves. But we have to have faith that we can do it. And that's what this election is all about. Restoring faith and restoring faith that we can establish new priorities. A new American security, as I've described it, measured not so much by the force of arms abroad, but by the strength of our society here at home. Our economy, our cities, our towns, our neighborhoods, and our families. This is the American dream that we have a responsibility to restore, to recapture, and in the process, we will recapture the spirit and the fact, the majesty of self-government in America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. There are microphones uh, at either side of the forum. Um, we have uh, probably, oh, 20 minutes or so for questions. And uh, I'll ask Mr. Agran to uh, just sort of rotate back and forth in the spirit of fairness. Sure. And uh, please line up and ask your questions. Oops. Yes, go ahead. Hi. You talked a lot about withdrawing our military presence from Europe and, and from Japan. What role do you see for the United States in the uh, New World Order? Uh, first of all, I don't like the term New World Order because it seems to be whatever George Bush says it is on 
one day after another during the week. Uh, but uh, I see us having a very affirmative role. The world has terrible problems. We need an affirmative foreign policy that is fundamentally built on a strong domestic economy. A strong domestic economy that allows us to compete and cooperate, I might add, on uh, trade, on matters of environmental protection, on relief of third world debt, on dealing with the terrible population problems around the world and in our own country. These are global problems that require global cooperation. I think the one thing that came out of the Persian Gulf War that might be a redeeming feature is the fact that the United Nations could possibly be reactivated as an institution that had real peacekeeping authority and a real military capacity, a defensive military capacity that could substitute for the kind of ad hoc U.S. interventionism that uh, over the long course of history serves this country very poorly. So I think there are many things that we can do in a positive sense, but it begins with a strong domestic economy so that we can cooperate effectively elsewhere. You know, uh, one of the reasons we aren't rushing humanitarian assistance to Eastern European democracies, to the Soviet Union, we keep extracting one thing after another, they've got to show more democracy, they've got to reduce their military expenditures, they've got to do this, they've got to do that. One reason we can't send anything is we don't have anything to send. We've spent it all. I would uh, suggest that one thing we might do is use our military presence, our continuing military presence in Western Europe to make an arrangement with the Eastern Europeans and with the Soviets to deliver supplies, the food that we can grow, humanitarian assistance, uh, to see to it that this winter people don't freeze to death and don't starve to death. We need post-Cold War policies that are rich in humanitarian assistance and that are really constructive in building a different kind of world. And that's very different from resorting to military presence as a, a first resort rather than as a last resort. I, th I think yeah. you may be some sort of subversive. The things you're saying make too much sense. <laughs> um, and if you could be said to lack charisma, I think most of the other uh, Demo announced Democrats anyway certainly do also. Um, I guess, thank you. <laughs> yeah, as far as I'm concerned anyway. Um, I'm interested in, in the political process and how it affects your candidacy. Yes. Um, you don't exist in the public consciousness, I think it's fair to say, at the moment anyway, except insofar as a few people may have heard of you. Right. I think uh, uh, corporate media uh, are, are I, I would say, responsible for that. Um, I'd like to ask you about that, How what you make of that, if you think that's true, uh, what you think the reasons are for that. Uh, as a, as a point of information, is, is your candidacy any less legitimate than that of any other uh, candidate for the Democratic nomination in, in terms of your filings or anything? You don't ever seem to get mentioned. Right. Um, so are, are, have you not done something that they have done? No, I've, uh, well, perhaps I haven't done some I things mean, that they've yeah. done, but <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done all the legitimate things you're supposed to do. I'm duly filed uh, with the FEC. Uh, we have filed our disclosure statements, our uh, campaign finance reports. We're in the process of raising matching funds in 20 states, which we expect to do by the end of the year. That qualifies you for federal matching funds and uh, gives you the opportunity, of course, to enjoy what amounts to a, uh, a subsidy for campaigning purposes. Uh, I made an announcement of my candidacy on August 22nd. So it turns out that happened to be the week of the Soviet coup through longstanding arrangements. So the timing wasn't a master stroke. <laughs> Some of you may have seen me on the uh, McNeil Air Show. They had actually interviewed me in advance of the announcement, but didn't run it until August 30th because of the Soviet coup and its aftermath. Uh, Roger Mudd did an extended interview with me. We got a terrific response uh, to that. I've been on the Larry King uh, uh, radio show. I've been on. Dan Rather's uh, CBS News report profiled there. The broadcast media have been relatively fair to me. Uh, the, uh, the print media has been a much more... Uh, they, they've been well, a much National more... Public Radio had a story about New Hampshire and didn't mention you at all. Well, you're right. Just have, this evening. We have called them repeatedly. And, uh, you know, for people who pride themselves on having um, journalistic skills worthy of the American people, uh, I think they're, uh, they're coming up to standards that are uh, really off the radar screen. I think that uh, when you hear that, you ought to give them a call. 
I had an unpleasant episode up in New Hampshire just the other day. Uh, the other candidates were given 20 minutes to speak to the gathered delegates at the New Hampshire State Convention. I was given five minutes. When I took nine minutes, they pulled the microphone on me. I mean, some, sometimes you just have to fight for the right to be heard in this society. I'll put myself uh, up against these guys in terms of an IQ test, in terms of programmatic proposals, any which way, they have to have the guts. They have to have the guts to accommodate all actively campaigning candidates, people who are, as we are, opening a headquarters. We've got it open already in New Hampshire. We're meeting people. Uh, I looked at the latest polls. They did one in New York, and it revealed that uh, when Mario Cuomo was taken out of the New Hampshire race, uh, this was for New Hampshire, oh, I'm sorry, this was for New York, um, that uh, uh, I registered at 1%, uh, which, as I say, was uh, only 3% behind Doug Wilder, <laughs> only 4% behind Governor Clinton, and only 10% behind the leader, Jerry Brown. So, I mean, when we're talking about candidates who range from 11% down to 1%, to say, well, this 1% isn't a figure of national prominence, None of these guys are figures of national prominence, let me tell you. None of us will become figures of national prominence until we have the kind of vigorous debate about issues that commands the attention of the American people. I enlist your help in all this. It's very important. It's very important that when you hear an unfair report that you call and complain about it. Well, do you, do you not think that you are, your candidacy because of what you're talking about is in some way being marginalized or excluded? Because that's really my, my, what my question is, yeah. is if you, if you think that's the case, and if you could, could uh, say why you think that is, why do, you, why do you think that happens in the political process that everybody likes to bemoan yes. uh, as how alienated everybody is from it while they're simultaneously excluding the only meaningful voices that are there? You're right. Uh, it is part of the problem. The fact is that those of us, the one of us, who is talking about cutting the military budget in half is a threat to the existing order. It's a threat to Democrats even more than it's a threat to Republicans, because Republicans know how to deal with this. They accuse us of being weak on defense, to which I respond, you're weak on health care, you're weak on education, you're weak on everything else in this country. Uh, I believe that Democrats are either going to confront this opportunity and seize it, or we're going to lose the election and we deserve to lose it in 1992. Yes, that's threatening to other candidates. It's threatening to their supporters. It's threatening to the PACs that are behind them. It's threatening to people who are resistant to change. But I believe if you talk with ordinary people, as we do in New Hampshire, and that's the blessing in all this, a presidential race isn't run across the country all at once. It is run in the state of New Hampshire first. New Hampshire, a state where there are just a little over a million people, if I get in the Democratic primary there as many votes as I got when I ran for mayor of Irvine, I'll be on every news show the next morning, I promise you. 15,000 votes would be roughly 15% in a crowded field, and they would say, what in the hell happened here? And what kind of message is this guy bearing? And how has it cha uh, changed and transformed the entire political process? That's why I'm appealing to you to not only <coughs> resist what is going on by way of this national media conspiracy of silence, but on top of that, invest some of your resources, whether they're dollars, whether they're your time, your energy, your skills, in helping us campaign in New Hampshire, where I'm telling you, when we talk with ordinary people, and I was on the streets of Portsmouth today, they say, this sounds right to me. Mm -hmm. I think the military budget ought to be cut. I think our troops ought to be brought home from Western Europe and from Japan. I think we ought to put more into education and health care. And I think we ought to have a blueprint to get it done. This is a popular plan, and I need help in taking it to people. Well, I'll talk to my mother who lives up there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I fully agree with, your, with what you've had to say today, and I'd like to say, first of all, you've renewed, partially renewed my faith as a Democrat. I'm wondering if you can sort of take me the rest of the way uh, here. You, your math skills are wonderful, and you have uh, dump, put some money aside to reduce the deficit. Unfortunately, we're, we're already running. Each budget that comes through is running maybe $200, $300 yes. in deficit. So the $50 that you're putting aside is, of course, a partial solution. And I'm wondering, you know, you're only willing to cut military by half, and I can understand that. Uh, maybe there are some domestic programs that you would find that you could cut, and I'm wondering if you had any suggestions. Yes, uh, uh, there are a few. 
uh, not a lot, but there are a few. The, uh, some of the agricultural subsidies, particularly to the large farms, uh, the corporate farms, uh, those ought to be trimmed, if not cut out entirely, uh, reorganized. I don't know how much savings ultimately there would be there. There'd be some, uh, some billions, no doubt. Also, uh, cutting agricultural subsidies to products that are killers like tobacco. I mean, it's ridiculous, some of the things that we do. But you add up all of this stuff. I heard Governor Wilder uh, talking about uh, how he was going to find 10% uh, of the federal budget was inefficiency, and he was going to cut the bureaucracy by 10%. I mean, that's a lot of crap. I've heard that stuff over and over again about how you're going you're to pay for everything by firing people who are there doing their jobs trying to institute and put in place and affect the, uh, the programs that are so important to people. Uh, you can effectuate some real savings in, uh, in programmatic changes. Five billion, 10 billion, maybe $15 billion a year. That's not gonna make a real dent in the deficit either. Uh, people who ask, it's funny, they don't ask other candidates how they're gonna pay for all these things. When I offer a proposal, you know, how we're gonna pay for this and then we're gonna make inroads on the deficit, then the response is usually not as uh, deferential as the way you ask the question. Well, geez, we're in so much deficit, what's 50 billion as compared to 250 or 300 billion? You say, well, you know, it's a start. It's an important start. But it's a start in another way too. It's a start not just with dollars, but in building confidence. See, people have so little confidence in government and in our ability to govern ourselves now that we have to reignite that confidence. And how do we do it? We change the priorities. We begin to see some improvements, improvements in our cities, improvements in our towns, improvements in our schools. Healthcare is suddenly getting better rather than in decline. The environment is actually beginning to turn around. All this stuff begins to happen. Then at that point, I think you can go to the American people and you say, you know, we need further revenues to do more things that will benefit this country. We need, for example, to tax millionaires so as to provide tax relief for people at the low end of the economic ladder. We need, we need on top of that, to institute energy taxes, to stop subsidizing the automobile and the air pollution that we suffer from. If we were to institute energy taxes in this country, we could raise 50, 100 billion dollars. We could eat into the deficit, but we could do other wonderful things as well. Clean up the environment, build energy efficient transportation systems, relieve ourselves of dependence on foreign oil so that we don't have to risk the lives of America's sons and daughters and have a president who orders the killing of hundreds of thousands of other people's sons and daughters, all because of our dependence on foreign oil. These are the things that can be done, but it's a series of steps to build confidence. And I think we've got to start with step one, national priorities. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yes, I have a two-part question. Uh, first of all, um, uh, you mentioned that you're a, a mayor of a city uh, and you have all these plans to improve our cities. Um, but I know that Irvine's a fairly small city. Uh, can you address how you feel you can relate to the problems of, of larger cities? Sure. And as sort of a corollary to that, um, one of the major problems in the country is, is a drug problem, um, especially in our urban centers and especially among people of color. And I'm curious as to, uh, well, you haven't mentioned anything about it. Do you have any plans to do anything about it? You say you're, you're sick of problems like pick, pick up litter for the environment. Um, do you have any, are, are you sick of, of just say no or programs like this and what, what do you put, intend to do? Yes. Um let me say in defense of myself and our city, we have some people here who were from Irvine, California. If you've walked precincts out there, you know it's a pretty big city. And uh, it's a city of 110,000 people, which I've pointed out is, um, the, it would be the largest city in population in New Hampshire. And it uh, actually is one of the 200 largest cities in the country. There's this notion um, that America is made up of huge cities from coast to coast. And actually, cities uh, over a million people, very few cities uh, of that size, most cities, uh, you know, they drop quickly down to 500,000, 200,000, 100,000, and 98 percent of all American cities are cities of under 100,000 people. So it's a sizable community. Um, it's a, an unusual community in that we are blessed with natural and material resources, a generally affluent population, but we've worked very hard to overcome a lot of problems, including the lack of affordable housing. We worked hard to build an integrated community that's 25% non-white now when it was 
uh, less than 10 percent non-white uh, just uh, 10 or 12 or 15 years ago. Uh, this, this is a result of hard work and a vision about what the city ought to be and how people ought to relate to one another within that city. We have had uh, problems of homelessness in our own communities, certainly in adjacent communities. We've had problems even of hunger. Uh, we've had problems of uh, senior citizens who have all kinds of difficulties, child care facilities that need to be provided. We have not had a large problem of urban violence. Uh, street violence was relatively uh, a very small problem in Irvine. We worked very hard to make sure it wouldn't become a problem. It seems to me if the cities, if the streets, if the neighborhoods aren't safe for the American people, then what about the promise in the Constitution of domestic tranquility? I mean, this is the most fundamental right people have, the right to be free in their neighborhoods and in their streets uh, and all the rest. And yes, a lot of that is connected to drug violence, and that's where I would focus attention. The violence that's associated with drug use. Not drug use per se, I mean, we learned the long and hard way in California, but the use, for example, of marijuana, when it was relegated to a, a largely decriminalized status, took care of that problem that we thought was so horrendous. And I think much of the drug use today is of that nature. It might be damaging to the individual, but it's fundamentally a victimless crime and ought to be decriminalized uh, as to those people who are users, possessors, traffickers even, without any incidental violence associated. Where there is violence, which is violence by way of driving under the influence of drugs, which is serious violence, or violence involving guns or other weapons, that kind of violence, that kind of drug use, that kind of abuse ought to be prosecuted and prosecuted vigorously. What we need to do also is relieve our justice system of a situation where you can't even get to court if you have a serious traffic accident that you're trying to get resolved, you can't get to court in five or six years because we're prosecuting all these petty drug crimes and traffic that in the end sends more black people and people of color to prisons disproportionately. It's a further form of institutional racism, I believe, and it has to be seen as such. We have to junk our existing policy, our so-called drug war, as an absolute failure. Almost everybody ought to be in accord that it's an absolute failure. Now, I don't know for sure, I don't know for sure what the answers are, but I know that we've got to move from the system we have now to a different kind of system. One of the things that we have had over the years is this sort of bounty whereby police officers nailing somebody for drug possession uh, can then get the benefit of property that's seized and so forth and use that for further police officers to sort of reinforce this go get them attitude, which more often than not focuses on the wrong people and the wrong kind of uh, drug abuse. I would say that uh, what we ought to do instead is when there are seizures of that sort, put it into education, put it into treatment, and begin to deal with that end of the problem uh, with uh, solutions that are constructive of that sort. Uh, finally, I would just say that uh, what we need to do uh, is call upon Mayor Schmoke, Kurt Schmoke of Baltimore and others who have had the courage as former prosecutors and uh, as people who have dealt with this problem, to get them together and acknowledge to the public, to the American people, to the world at large, that our war on drugs has been an abysmal failure. And we're going to bring together the best minds and we're going to use our federal system in the most creative ways to try harm reduction programs here and there and elsewhere and see what works and build an anti-drug policy that will ultimately serve the interests of the American people. Yes. Yes. In your efforts to more effectively use revenues, would you consider means testing Social Security so that rather being an entitlement to rich and poor alike, it would serve more effectively as an insurance to those who actually are in need during their old age? I'm a little uneasy about means testing because it's kind of a violation of a, a promise that was made a long time ago. One of the nice things about Social Security is it's sort of universal possibilities begins to level the benefits, rich and poor. Uh, it is very regressive on the taxing end, and I think the focus needs to be there. This idea that uh, we only tax uh, a certain percentage, uh, rather we only tax a, a certain number of thousands of dollars, I think $56,000, and beyond that there's no tax at all, 
is highly regressive as a taxing scheme. So I would say lifting the ceiling makes a lot of sense. Lowering the taxes, the payroll taxes paid by ordinary citizens, hardworking people who are sweating it out to earn 20 or 25 or $30,000 a year, that ought to be undertaken. So I think the taxing mechanism ought to be changed. I'm a little uh, leery about uh, paying out benefits because uh, uh, on a, a means-tested basis, I'll tell you what I would rather explore is a wealth tax in this country. I've thought about a little bit uh, what I call a 1% 1% tax, uh, a 1% wealth tax on the 1% wealthiest people in the country. Now, I haven't, I haven't done all the numbers on it, but uh, my uh, belief is that we would be raising 40 to $50 billion a year that way. Because people who are wealthy, really wealthy, are really, really wealthy. <laughs> and taking 1% of that a year, after all, they get a 10% return on whatever wealth they've got anyway, for the most part. Taking 1% of that a year, I think, would be an ideal way of beginning to redirect uh, the resources of this country from top to bottom and make things more fair. After all, these are the people who got rich through all the schemes and crooked operations of the uh, 1980s. And it's fair, I think, to go after them as a matter of tax fairness and as a matter of uh, justice in our society. So I think, uh, I think that merits looking at. Um, and uh, we, we plan to look at that in some detail. Yes. I wanted to get back to the, uh, the issue of the budget deficit. Now, last year, our budget deficit was about $350 billion. Um, we spent about $300 billion on defense. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out if we didn't spend a dime on defense, we'd still have a budget deficit left over. Now, the, I guess my question is, I've heard you uh, talk about reducing the deficit on the margins, you know, $50 billion from defense cuts and $50, from a tax on the, $50 billion on a tax on the wealthy. But it's still not adding up, and, and this deficit's still there. Now, my question is, there's one of three ways to reduce that deficit. you either got to uh, cut the budget, you've got to raise taxes, or you've got to somehow get the economy growing so that you grow out of that, that budget deficit. And, and what's going to be your approach to make up that, that remainder? Well, first of all, if we did bring home $150 billion a year as we move through the economic transition, we would have a much more productive economy. I don't want to overstate this, but it would seem to me it would generate easily 25 to $50 billion in additional revenues because people working here would be uh, producing here, purchasing here, job-intensive kinds of activities, rebuilding our infrastructure and the like. These things generate additional taxes, additional revenues. Um, I think I've been fairly forthcoming, uh, talking about energy taxes that could be 50 to $100 billion over time, uh, 50 to $100 billion per year. We're talking about wealth taxes, could be 40 to $50 billion, the $50 billion in saving that I referred to uh, initially. Um, come on, where are the other guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we've been trying to figure out All right. for the last 10 years. <laughs> All right, and, and I, I just think, uh, I just think uh, as you question me about this, you have to question the other candidates as well and question them hard. And don't let them say as they do, well, we, th we think the, uh, the military budget is going to be coming down, and as it does, we'll do this and we'll do that and so forth. And they're very general, very, very general. And I think you've got to question them about the specifics. I mean, we know how to tax people. When I asked Joe Kennedy here Monday yes. if he would support a 50% reduction in military spending, he said, well, we can't disarm. I know. These guys, I'll tell you, uh, inside the Beltway, there's a disease. There is a disease there. They talk to themselves. They talk to the lobbyists. Then they talk to the media. The media says, well, these are the important guys, so we've got to interview them. The media prints what these guys say. And the guys uh, who read it out there think, well, this is what you've got to say. And we'd never get beyond first base on any of this. That's why we've got to break through in a dramatic way. Uh, you know, the, pro the process of change uh, I've learned over the years, and uh, I think it's no, no secret to others, often requires, you know, working at it year after year after year. I mean, I've been calling for bringing our military spending under control since the late 1970s, when Carter went back on his promise to cut military spending by 7%. 
He greased the skids for Reagan. When Reagan and Bush came in, they escalated the military budget, doubling it in five or six years. I've been arguing against this kind of radical escalation of the military budget year in and year out. And now, now I think the American people are ready for this dramatic change. They have seen it. They have seen the end of the Cold War. They've seen it with their own eyes. They know that if we have new national leadership, we can bring about dramatic change. But the old dinosaurs are still in charge. And we have to demonstrate, we the people, that something different is afoot out there. And what better place to demonstrate it than in a New Hampshire primary where an unknown or little known former mayor with a precise program of how to do some of these things gets 10% of the vote or 15% of the vote. Let's shock this society into the belief that we can establish new priorities for ourselves. That's what this campaign ought to be all about. It's not real complicated. It can be done. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, recently, we've had in the news the uh, debate over the civil rights bill in Washington. And um, in California, Governor, we Governor Wilson uh, vetoed a gay rights bill. What would you do to protect civil rights of, um, of minorities and gays in America? I hope you have a chance to read the pamphlet that uh, we've distributed in my biography. Um, well, that's, the, that's a spe the announcement speech I gave on the day that Gorbachev came back to work. That's my announcement speech. <laughs> Somehow they covered his speech and not mine. I don't know why. But anyway, the uh, little pamphlet uh, has a biography about me and things that we've done in Irvine. And one of the things that we did was adopt an ordinance. Mind you, this is in Republican, conservative, right-wing Orange County. Two and a half to one, Republicans outnumber Democrats. And they aren't nice Republicans either, not like some of the liberal ones back here. They're tough, angry Republicans who hate Democrats and certainly hate liberal Democrats. But what did we do? We adopted an ordinance, a human rights ordinance, that bars discrimination in housing, in jobs, in public uh, accommodations and access to public services on all the traditional bases, race, color, national origin, sex, disability, but also sexual orientation. We adopted that ordinance, and uh, it was in law for more than a year. And some citizens organized, citizens organized a, uh, uh, an initiative to repeal that provision that uh, protected gays and lesbians from discrimination. It protected uh, straight people as well from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. It was a very narrow, very bitter vote. Uh, it was a bitter defeat. We lost by just uh, 3 or 4 percent. Uh, we worked as hard as we could. But to this day, I'm as committed as I've ever been on this issue because I'll tell you, this is the cutting edge of civil rights. Uh, in that campaign, I learned a great deal. One, one of the things I learned is that you can't segment your commitment to civil rights. I'll tell you, there are lots of gays and lesbians in Orange County who hate blacks. And I would get them together in a room and I would say, look, I'm not in this unless we're in this for civil rights for everybody, for women, for gays, for lesbians, for blacks, for people of color. And that's why we need a national civil rights law and state civil rights laws that extend protection to everybody against invidious discrimination. That's the way we build a community of harmony. And that's also the way that I think we uh, win back the White House on this issue of civil rights. Instead of being so nervous about it, running away from it, we need to remind people of what the great idea of civil rights is, you know, living in some measure of harmony, recognizing the worth of each and every one of us. And I think then it restores the, the positive impression that people have about the civil rights struggle that took place in this country. And when President Bush uh, runs a, a racist policy or a racist campaign, when he talks about quotas or sends up a clearly unqualified candidate to the Supreme Court uh, on the basis of race, when he does all this to try to drive a wedge in the American people, uh, when he does a Willie Horton style commercial, we need Democrats who will come out and say that this is a president who is practicing racist politics, pure and simple. 
Did you have a follow-up on that? Or? I satisfied you, huh? Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Agron, as a prospective commander-in-chief of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces, what's your view of the United Nations vote to go to war in the Persian Gulf? Is this another example of uh, ad hoc military interventionism? Uh, and what do you see as the forces in the world that uh, can be justifiably opposed militarily and uh, in your tenure, if you were elected in the next four years, recognizing that a lot of that force would be the force of the United States? Yes. I think there might have been a case made after three or four or five years for the use of force to reverse the Iraqi aggression. I think if you're serious about economic sanctions, you have to be patient. After all, no one was rushing to resort to military force to uh, deal with the problems in South Africa when those sanctions didn't work the first year, the second year, the third year, and beyond. Sanctions take time. I think they would have worked here. Uh, but whether they would have or not, I want to remind you that President Bush, not I, President Bush said, when the United Nations adopted a resolution imposing economic sanctions and enforcing those sanctions through military presence. President Bush said that this represented a wonderful day in world history, a day in which other than violent means would be used to reverse aggression, that the world community was united. And it was just a matter of a few months after that that we then uh, interposed offensive forces. We took our defensive forces, transformed them into offensive forces, and of course, you know the history after that. Shortly after that, uh, went to war. 200,000 people dead. The Persian Gulf destroyed environmentally. Refugees fleeing by the millions. Restoration of an anti-Semitic, anti-democratic regime that makes a mockery of human rights. This is victory. This is foreign policy success. Was anything gained? I think all that was gained was the reversal of the aggression, which is very important. But it could have been gained by other means, I submit. And uh, certainly it could have been gained by means that uh, over time would not have cost as many lives. I believe that firmly. There are instances. <laughs> I'll take this as the last uh, question. Hi. Um, at a time that we are experiencing record high unemployment, what kind of jobs are you going to offer United States service people when they come back? You're, you're talking about firing, actually firing hundreds of thousands of people, and what kind of jobs are you going to give them? There aren't even jobs for people who are unemployed here now. Well, in fact, there are jobs to be done, useful jobs to be done not make work, but work that makes sense. Let me describe some of these possibilities. Demobilized uh, soldiers and sailors and the like, uh, they could be employed in either the civilian sector or they could remain in the military for that matter under special contractual arrangements uh, to deal with problems of uh, militarily caused toxic waste. We have toxic waste cleanup that's gonna keep this country busy thousands hundreds of thousands of people busy for decades. Under our own city in Irvine, there's a toxic plume from a nearby military base that qualified us for Superfund status. Hooray. We qualified for Superfund status, but it'll be years before we get any effective action to clean it up. People can be put to work on that to the extent that they have technical skills. They also can be put to work on disaster relief around the world. Why is it every time that there's a typhoon we have 800 phone numbers on TV and call 900 and come down to the local fire station to give some cans and some food and some blankets. Why don't we use our airlift capacity, our great military capacity, to provide humanitarian relief? We can count on one of these disasters um, once, twice, three times a year. These, uh, uh, these uh, purposes would be extremely valuable. Also, uh, I'll tell you, sending people back to school is a proven, effective way of creating human resources that will serve this country long into the future. What's wrong with sending somebody back to the classroom and paying them to go back to the classroom? They become a very valuable 
employee? What's wrong with hiring them, using their skills to do uh, the rebuilding chores in our cities and in our towns? You know, it's a funny thing. Uh, when the, when the uh, Persian Gulf War uh, and the build-up to it was underway, I was struck by the fact that we were able to erect whole cities almost overnight. 500,000 people were being housed in what was previously uh, in, uh, uh, uninhabited and uh, uninhabitable desert. And we made it all work. Why can't we do that at home? Why can't we provide decent emergency shelter here at home? That requires a lot of work. It's constructive work. It benefits our society. There's no end to the work that can be done. You have a follow-up on yeah. that? Yeah. Who is going to pay these people? It's still the government will still pay them. They is could. That what you're saying? It could be paid. So how would that cut the budget? Well, let me tell you one thing. I would. Them. Well, one thing I would suggest is that the money that goes back to cities and towns. <coughs> if a city has a terrible problem with homelessness, as most major cities do, and they want to provide decent emergency shelter, why not take some of the money, some of the many, many millions of dollars that would be returned to American cities? Why not the money that's returned here to Boston? Take that money contract with the army if you want or if these people are demobilized with civilian defense workers uh, to build emergency shelter it's our money it's just a question of recirculating it directing it here at home instead of directing it abroad why provide housing for troops in western europe instead of providing housing for american citizens here on the streets of america i just think it's sort of a common sense approach to how we can have people who have great skills working here at home to rebuild this society. We've been so programmed to think that that's not possible, that we've got to overcome that despair and cynicism as the first step in dealing with all the problems that we face. Let me take a moment here if I've uh, satisfactorily answered that that's to fine. wrap up, okay? I just want to ask those of you who are interested to help us in this campaign uh, by help us, I mean get involved. Uh, if you're persuaded that my candidacy makes sense, that you'd like to back it, I invite you, I implore you to sign up in the back, take more literature, indicate your interest. If your interest, on the other hand, is for another candidate, great. Go support that candidate. But if you make a choice, uh, make a conscious choice about candidates, and if you're deciding that, well, I don't think I'm going to do anything, Make sure you understand that's a conscious choice as well. It's a choice that says that you don't believe that there's anything that you can do this time around that will make a difference or is that, wor or is that uh, worth your investing, your time, your effort, your dollars. I would also implore some of you who are maybe uh, dollar rich but time poor. We are qualifying in state after state, part of the 20 state uh, requirement requires us to raise $5,000 in one state after another. And um, Massachusetts is one of the targeted states. We've raised some of the money, but not all of it. Uh, the first political contribution you make uh, may be your best. And uh, I remember in 1972, my wife and I gave first $25 to George McGovern, then $50. By the time it was all over, we gave $300 to George McGovern at a time when dollars were really dollars. I don't ask you to do that, but you might consider putting in $5 or $10, putting in five hours or 10 hours. One thing I'll tell you, on the streets of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Manchester, and Concord, if you haven't uh, already rediscovered the possibilities of self-government in America, you can rediscover that possibility through this campaign. So please consider it. Please be a part of it if you're inclined. And in any case, uh, be a part of the uh, rebuilding of our American society. Thank you very much.